In the meantime, we'll head over to the phone bridge to Josh with space.com. Hi, Josh Skinner. Thank you all so much for doing this. Um, this question is for all three of you. Uh, what were the most out of this world and your favorite experiments or tech demos you got to be a part of on this mission? And uh, for Williams and one more specifically, did your did the extension of your mission create any new opportunities for experiments or research that was not originally planned for the expedition? You should start. Sure. Um, so while I was up there, we performed about 150 different experiments. Uh, of those, the ones that you know the most about are the ones where you end up being one of the guinea pigs in the <laughs> experiment. Uh, so there's about a dozen different experiments where we were doing things to me and seeing how my body adapted. Uh, whether that was uh, a vascular aging experiment where we're measuring how stiff my arteries get because life in space uh, tends to manifest itself as accelerated aging. And so we can better understand how the human body responds to that and hopefully provide some treatments on the ground to help with, with problems that as you get older, you encounter. Uh, how our immune system works. Uh, did a, a whole study on the immune system and how my body was responding. Uh, life on orbit tends to suppress the immune system and why does that happen? We're trying to understand that so that we can help design better treatments on the ground, but also understand how we can support crews that go deeper into space on longer missions. Um, probably one of the most uh, shocking experiments, uh, Butch and Sonny got me to, got to watch me wire myself up to uh, <laughs> muscle stimulation pads and, uh, and shock myself uh, and trying to figure out how do we, how do we keep our muscles strong uh, when we don't have access to all the equipment we have on the International Space Station because as we go to the moon and on to Mars, uh, that's a lot of extra mass, and if we can do it with smaller equipment, maybe that works. Uh, the side benefit of that is anybody that's been bedridden on the ground, that's also a treatment for how you can support somebody that's been, been kind of tied to a bed for a long period of time and help keep them healthy. Uh, so there's a benefit directly to the ground. That's three of them. Uh, they're all interesting, uh, and you know I'm one of many subjects, and it takes years to get enough subjects to go through the space station to be able to generate enough data to draw some conclusions. And so that's why research up there takes a long time. Uh, but the, the value is clear. Uh, just very briefly, there's some medications on Earth that work well with a certain age group, but the same medication doesn't work so well with another. So it's a capillary flow experiment to try to understand how that medication is flowing through our bodies, and maybe there's something we can figure out as to why those things are. And we're trying to figure that out, and that's, that's very beneficial, obviously, to mankind and may benefit some of our families one day. Yeah, and I, I just want to highlight some uh, other science that's going on up there because we have a, just an amazing person, Don Pettit, who's up on the space station getting ready to come home. And uh, every day he's up to something and just trying to highlight what microgravity does and how it is, as well as amazing photography, which I'm sure a lot of you have probably seen out there. And the fact that he can take a picture of a red Sprite or a blue jet and have a picture from the space station looking down on a lightning cloud is just incredible. And it enlightens all of us into what is actually going on in the universe. And that's just simply because he's curious. And that is something that's actually, like I said, we're sharing and we're showing off to everybody like, wow, you know, we think we know what's going on, but we really don't. And if you just open your eyes and make some observations, like Don does every morning at 4 a.m., uh, we'd learn a whole lot. Yeah, Don's, so it's, a, it's a great place. Yeah, Don's taking potatoes he's growing <laughs> and the nitrogen produced in the roots of the potatoes to nourish the peanuts that he's growing. I mean, it's pretty special. He's a special he, guy. He's awesome. <laughs> Marsha Dunn with the Associated Press. Welcome back, everybody. Um, Butch, this question is for you. Where do you lay the blame for your Starliner test flight? Clearly, Starliner was not ready to fly when it did. Whom do you hold responsible for everything that happened? Thanks. That is a question that I cannot answer in uh, a couple of comments, but I'll start with me. There were some issues, of course, that happened with Starliner. There were some issues, of course, that happened that prevented us from returning on Starliner. And I'll start with me. There were questions that I, as a commander of the spacecraft, that I should have asked 
and I did not. At the time, I didn't know I needed to. And maybe you could call that hindsight, but I'll start and point the finger and I'll blame me. I could ask some questions and the answers to those questions could have turned the tide. Um, so blame, that's a term, I don't like that term, but certainly there's responsibility throughout uh, all the programs uh, and certainly you can, you can start with me. Um, responsibility with Boeing, yes. Responsibility with NASA, yes. All the way up and down the chain, we all are responsible. We all own this and we are in this business Trust, you cannot do this business without trust. You have to have ultimate trust. And for someone to step forward and, the, and these different organizations say, hey, I'm culpable for part of that issue, uh, that goes a long way to maintaining trust. So we're not gonna look back and say this happened or that happened and that person's or that issue or that entity's to blame. We're gonna look forward and say, what are we gonna use our lessons learned from this whole process and make sure that we are successful in the future? This is a tough business. The analogy about it is it's always a curvy road. It's never straight in this business. And minimizing those curves, curves and effectual, uh, being systems and processes in effect to, to prevent some of these curves is what we have to do as we leave low Earth orbit and go beyond to the moon and beyond that. So we're going to look forward. And that's, uh, that's the focus. All right. Our next question on the phone bridge is from Anthony with Spectrum News. Hello, uh, welcome back everyone. It's uh, nice seeing everyone uh, return healthy and safe. Uh, I have a question for uh, both you, Sunny, and uh, Butch. Uh, given the opportunity, would you guys uh, go up on Starliner again? Yes, because we're gonna rectify all the issues that we, that we encountered. Yeah. We're gonna fix them. We're gonna make it work. Uh, Boeing's completely committed. NASA is completely committed, and with that, I'd get on in a heartbeat. Yeah, I would, I would agree. The, the spacecraft is really capable. Uh, there were a couple things that need to be fixed, like Butch mentioned, and um, folks are actively working on that. Uh, but it's a, it is a great spacecraft, and it has a lot of capability that other spacecraft don't have. And to see that thing successful and to be part of that program is an honor. Our next question is from Jackie with the Times of London. Yes, hello, and welcome back to Earth. Um, I wondered about the stuck, stranded, marooned narrative, and to what extent were you aware of that narrative playing out around that down here, and has that been frustrating for you to have to address? Thank you. I'm sorry, that was a little garbled. The stuck marooned narrative. Oh, stuck marooned narrative. Oh, the stuck maroon narrative. We heard about that. Yeah, we heard about that. Somebody mentioned um, that. We've said this before. We had a plan, right? The plan went way off for what we had planned, but because we're in human spaceflight, we prepare for any number of contingencies because this is a curvy road. You never know where it's going to go. We prepare for this. So we, as Sonny used the term, and it's a great term, we pivoted to all that training we did that we didn't think we needed to do, and a lot of people didn't think we needed to do, but we did it anyway, as we pivoted to this other preparation, and that is what makes human spaceflight, your human spaceflight program special. It is hard, like I said, and preparing for any number of contingencies is what we do. It happened to be me and Sonny involved in this, but it could have been any one of the astronauts. There's 40 or so of us eligible for assignment. It would have been any one of us that would have been in the same situation, mm -hmm. or could have been in the same situation, and would have done the exact same thing that we did because they would have gone prepared just like we did. Yeah, and one, one addition to that, you know, this is a lot bigger than you know, Butch and myself, like we've talked about already, this is a this is the International Space Station program, and there's a lot of you know wheels that are turning and wickets that are that we have to go through to get people up to the International Space Station to do all of the amazing science that we're doing up there. We recognize that, we know that, just like anybody else in the astronaut office. And we came, as Butch has mentioned before, prepared. And we were ready to do that pivot and be part of that bigger thing that's not just about us. Knowing that everybody on the ground, there's a huge team of people, like I quickly mentioned in my quick thank you, but there's a huge group of people who are looking at the whole program and understanding how and what was the best time and way to get us back home. We knew that, and we were ready to 
wait until that decision was made, and that was fine. And I'll also add that we're grateful for people that, I don't think they were looking just at us, that when they make recommendations, it was made, and that was fine. And I'll also add that we're grateful for people that, I don't think they were looking just at us, that when they make recommendations, we can do this, we can do that. They're looking what's best for the mm -hmm. human spaceflight program, for our nation's goals. They're not looking just about Sonny and Butch. And we appreciate those entities that do that and reach out and say, hey, we can do this, we can do that, we can do that. And NASA says, hey, we got a plan, we came prepared, here's what our plan is, and we think this is the best plan because it doesn't disrupt the flow of how these missions lay out. So, and that's the one we went with. All right, we'll take our next question here in the room. Andrea, go ahead. Thank you guys for being available today. Um, so your mission became unusually political. Given your experience, do you think other astronauts are gonna get nervous that they could be caught in the middle of a political fight? And is there a point where you know this starts to jeopardize safety of a mission when you start looking at all these politics that come into play? Thank you. You know, I think Nick's got some good insight on this. <laughs> <laughs> good job. <laughs> so, so the way I'd like to answer that is that when we're up there operating in space, you don't feel the politics, you don't feel any of that. It's focused strictly on mission and, and, and you know, if I, I step back a little bit to the question before, Butch and Sonny talk up here, they make it sound like, you know, well, you know, everybody figured out what they could do with us. The reality is they are highly skilled, very technically competent, and it took everything I had on every day to keep up with them as they're moving along. So they, they were more than just gap fillers on the station. They were productive, pushing the station mission forward. Uh, and Sunny was the station commander, so she was calling the shots. Um, so you get in that environment, that operational environment, the politics, they don't, they don't make it up there. Um, we are working as a part of an international team that spans the globe and works with you know, half a dozen mission control centers spread around the globe that are talking in multiple languages, and we just figure out how to make it happen, and that's the magic of human spaceflight, is that we can focus on something so positive that pulls people together, um, and we've been doing that for a long time. Yeah. 